what would you say are the key tenets of what we now call sort of dominant logic? Basic yeah, yeah. I mean, I think we have the ten premises which people have read about, and I think you know there's several there that are so instrumental. This notion of co-creation of value uh, with the customer, but with all your stakeholders. It's kind of like there's an old view that we have the firm, and then there's this environment around it. You know, and government is separate, and customers are separate, and suppliers are separate. Or, uh, what research scholars and methodologists would call exogenous. They're outside, they're external. And we say, like, maybe they're endogenous. Maybe if you have the right attitude and view, that you could collaborate and work together. You know, and that, that's a very important perspective. You know, uh, you know, Honda Motor Company, I mean, phenomenal story in Toyota, and, and you know, um, Attack the, attack the United States, uh, bitter enemies, the war ends, you know, Honda decides in the early 1950s that they're going to be a global auto producer. They go after the U.S. market. I mean, how did they do that? Well, they did that by saying, would you let's understand the culture you know, let's have some Japanese people live in Japan or in the U.S. understand, work with government, you know, like, let's not view them as the enemy, let's work together, let's cooperate and let's collaborate, you know. A uh, whole different kind of perspective and a different view. So collaboration uh, rather than competition. Yeah. Uh, it's, the systems build upon each other, so you don't get rid of competition. But competition informed by collaboration creates better advantage. Uh, and so, sure, you're going to compete. I uh, am fortunate the last few years in many different ways, but I've been a judge at the, at the first competition, which is a robotics competition uh, for high school students in the United States. And it's trying to uh, interest students in science and engineering because there's a decline in interest and so on. And so all those kids are competing with each other from different high schools and from high schools that have great advantage in terms of economic wealth and from poor high schools and yeah, you know, I've been involved in other competitions and sports but you know if somebody needs to borrow some tools they go to the booth next to them and they borrow some tools and they work together and they celebrate who wins and never has there been a fist fight or a brawl or or whatever like you would see on a football field or hockey field and those are wonderful sports too but it's just kind of this Let's kind of work together. We're competing. But gee, can't we kind of celebrate also the collaboration within a particular context? So, so it's, it's a collaboration kind of built upon still a competitive instinct and, and seeking advantage, seeking to do better, but with kind of a fairer rule set. Now, what kind of conse consequences will this have for a business? Any business? Well, I think, you know... Uh, Pekka, that's a really interesting question, and in part the answer depends upon also how other systems adjust because societies evolve and develop over time. And so if the system develops in terms of anti-trust law, or what's called competition policy in, in Europe, uh, and it's certainly in the U.S. the way it evolved is that competitors can't talk to each other because they might be colluding to cheat the customer, you know, and so like, let's not collaborate, let's not work together. But some of the big opportunities are such big science projects and require such investment to have breakthroughs that sometimes collaboration is good. So, so how it impacts the firm is in part these other institutions because all, all institutions in society government policy, norms. You're, you think, well, what are the norms in Finland? What are our key values? Finland, Sweden, the U.S., Mexico. All those are co-created. I mean, the government can't say, here's the set of values and we'll live by these values. They, they, they're co-created by people working together. Even, in fact, the best example of co-creation is language. You know, language develops because there's a sender and receiver and we kind of negotiate that meaning. Uh, 
English in the U.S. is much more fluid than formal English because we let words kind of pop up from uh, the ghettos and gangs and Silicon Valley and we kind of invent concepts quickly and it's, it's a little sloppy but it's, it, it's kind of a quickly evolving form because it's co there's more co-creation in it. And so that's the real challenge I'm, I'm implementing because there's, 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 there's kind of cultures within organizations that can be not supportive of service technology, but also within industries, okay? And see, and what happens in industries is over time, these kind of established practices develop, you know, and that, that's occurred for hundreds or thousands of years. So if you were a squire and you had a son, you know, you would socialize and educate him and he would go and study with another squire and he would learn about uh, knighthood and, and, and principles and romancing ladies and all these other things. And it was like this became the way we did it. Not necessarily the right way, but it's kind of a replication on that. So, so where you see the most opportunities that we have observed is in the rapidly changing industry. So in information technology, information communication technology, these areas that have kind of developed very, very quickly around the world, they're much more receptive than a very kind of old established industry that has lots of norms and values and, and procedures. And it also complements very much the ICT industries because it, 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 it coincides with what Norman had talked about as of the liquefaction of resources, you know, when things become purely digital. So it's not only moving quickly, but it actually kind of fits the paradigm at the furthest level of potential evolution as we know it right now. So what it should do for the firm, I'm going to get back because I kind of went around, we have some time here, is in, in principle, here's how uh, SD logic should improve firm performance. Now, I'll, I'll just talk about economic performance of the firm. There's other measures, and we encourage those. But as you embrace and practice the principles of co-creation, the customer is an operant resource, the employee is an operant resource, they're working together with us, you reduce the number of errors. I make less errors with my employees, I make less errors with my customers and suppliers. And as you reduce errors, you lower your cost. Uh, secondly, if you've been around companies where the employees are engaged and where the customer is having a great experience, it's just a fun place to work. I mean, so people want to go to work, they get a lot of enjoyment from their work, they have a lot of fun in their work. And when people have fun and they enjoy their work, then what happens is they work harder, they work smarter because they know they're being listened to. So again, that increases economic productivity. And then the third thing is, is we believe just from a normative perspective, it's kind of the right way to practice business. So we think it has an impact on long-term performance, which is more difficult to try to measure and parse out. So it cuts errors, engages people more, lowers costs, enhances revenues, higher quality, overall performance. And so when it works at the, at the best, and many times it doesn't, but when it works at its best, it really ought to uh, have those particular influences and impacts. So there's not just the economic performance, but also a sense of fair process to it. Yeah, and the fair process is very, very important. In fact, actually in, in the work, if you read the research literature on job satisfaction or satisfaction with public services, if people feel the process is fair and the outcome's bad, their satisfaction doesn't go down too much because they, you know, the next time when I go on and talk to the boss, I'm going to have a fair shot at getting that raised. The next time, you know, I do something, I have a fair shot. But if, if you don't like the outcome and you believe the process is bad, then you think, gee, I'm not, I'm not going to have a second chance. So, so open communication of fairness, even though you may not get the results you want, it's that belief that there's not a hidden agenda, that, that it's open. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, excellent, excellent point.